Judiciary Committee will come to order. This hearing, entitled Book Bans, How Censorship Limits Liberty in Literature, will come to order. In 1928, the city of Chicago banned a book known as The Wonderful Wizard of Oz from all of its public libraries. Local leaders claimed that the book would have, quote, an ungodly influence on its readers. We now consider The Wonderful World, pardon me, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz to be, in the words of the Library of Congress, a timeless American classic. Unfortunately, there is a long history in our country of banning books we now consider classic works of literature. This video, which I'm about to show, will indicate this is not the first time that the Senate Judiciary Committee has considered the negative influence of books. I ask them to start the video. If you want to know the cause of all this, here it is. It's these rotten comic books. Cut them out and things like this would not happen. It is my opinion, without any reasonable doubt and without any reservation, that comic books are an important contributing factor in many cases of juvenile delinquency. A Tennessee school board has banned the critically acclaimed graphic novel, Mouse. It is a true story about the horrors of the Holocaust by Art Spiegelman. Mouse is the German word for mouse. The school board claimed it banned the graphic novel because of profanity and nudity. I read the minutes of the uh, school board spending the mouse. Most of the people, it was clear from their minutes, had not read the book. We still had eyeballs uh, see those images. And then, oh, okay, this is a, a picture of nudity, so that we can prohibit. And, and this over here, this has uh, a bad word. But as far as they're concerned, as long as they stop short and saying, we're banning this because this history makes us uncomfortable, and we don't want our kids to have to be exposed to these things, you're on safer ground. This process is really unnecessary. We are professionals in our classrooms, and we know what is best for our students. The kids want to read books. The kids in here are asking me, can I go get a book and read? And they're so excited. And I have to say no, because I haven't had a chance to go through all of them, to catalog them, to write them all down, to send off to somebody that is going to tell me, them, if they can or cannot read the books in my classroom library. In the 1850s, Uncle Tom's Cabin a classic anti-slavery novel was banned throughout the southern United States. Two decades later, in 1873, Congress passed the Comstock Act, a law that mandated up to five years in prison for any person who sold or distributed a book that was, quote, obscene, lewd, or lascivious. The law did not define the terms, and hundreds of Americans were convicted for distributing books about topics such as atheism and reproductive health. As video showed, this committee itself held a series of hearings in 1954 to examine the threat that comic books like Superman posed to children. The anti-comics panic culminated in the industry's comics code that censored comic books for decades. That may seem absurd today, but extremists continue to fight popular graphic novels like Mouse and other books. In 2022, there were over a thousand requests to ban books at public schools and libraries, the most in almost 20 years. Here are just a few of the books that have been banned or restricted in schools and libraries over the past few years. I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, The Handmaid's Tale, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, A Raisin in the Sun, Brave New World, and Beloved. These are books by, written by some of the greatest American authors, including trailblazing black women like Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou. Even works written by Martin Luther King Jr. were banned temporarily in a fervor to limit access to books about race or racism, all in the name of prohibiting material supposedly related to critical race theory. Let's be clear, efforts to ban books are wrong, whether they come from the right or the left. While we ban books like Mouse or To Kill a Mockingbird <clears throat> in the name of protecting students, we are instead denying these students an opportunity to learn about different people and difficult subjects. 
Limiting access to a book about anti-Semitism or racism does not protect students from the actual history or the reality that hate still exists. In the name of protecting students, politicians have targeted books that include LGBTQ plus subject matter. One out of every four banned books features LGBTQ plus characters and themes, according to Penn America. No one is advocating for sexually explicit content to be available in an elementary school library or a children's section of a library. That's a distraction from the real challenge. I understand and respect that parents may choose to limit what their children read, especially at younger ages. My wife and I did, others do too. But no parent should have the right to tell another parent's child what they can and cannot read in school or at home. Every student deserves access to books that reflect their experiences and help them better understand who they are. I want to commend Senator Cornyn, who said last year, and I quote, as a general rule, I don't favor banning age-appropriate and subject-appropriate books for children. They need to hear a diversity of views. I agree with him. That's exactly right. Unfortunately, librarians and teachers across this country who are just doing their jobs have been threatened with physical violence and criminal prosecution by a small group of zealots. These efforts to ban books violate our most cherished principles as Americans and betray our values as a nation. We must protect our students and their freedom to read and learn. With that, I hand this off to Ranking Member Graham for his opening statement. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and so if you're a parent out there listening to this hearing, I would encourage you to advocate for your child. I would encourage you to go to the school district, the library, wherever you believe is appropriate on behalf of your child. Um, you have an obligation as a parent to lend your voice <clears throat> to the cause you think helps your child develop in the right way. About this hearing, what is our role here? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to take over every school board in the country and veto their decisions about what books go into public schools? In the library, you know, I hadn't spent a lot of time in the library. That speaks poorly of me. But am I supposed to, as a United States senator, take over the libraries of all of this country and be the final say of what goes in a library? I hope not. I think not. So this is an important hearing in this regard. It shows the difference of the two parties on this issue. School boards, whether elected or appointed, in our system should be the people we go to to talk about what's in a school. A library board should be the group of people decides what goes in a library. And if you don't like the outcome, at least you can complain. And to all the parents out there who believe there's a bunch of stuff in our schools being pushed on your children that go over the line, you're absolutely right. To governors and to local officials who want to make sure that agendas are not being uh, pushed upon your children, you're right to speak up. In Burbank, California, some school district banned Huckleberry Finn. To kill a mockingbird. I don't agree with that, but that was your right to make that decision. So what I want to leave with you, Mr. Chairman, is that we on this side, I think to a person, I, I understand what Senator Cornyn is saying, but I, I, he'll speak for himself in a minute. I don't think there's one person on our side of the aisle believes that we, the federal government, should be deciding these issues. And if you don't like the outcome, pick a school board you do like. And it's wrong for conservatives to try to pick school board members. It's absolutely okay for every liberal organization uh, to destroy conservatives who make decisions they don't like. So we're not buying this. We're not going to be intimidated. To governors out there, I look to you for leadership on such issues. Some are providing it, and congratulations to you. To parents, don't give an inch on this. Speak up. Violence is never the answer. But show up, speak up, and a lot of the times the books that are being complained about by parents, you can't even read in the public hearing. And I won't read it today, but somebody needs to understand 
that this is a big issue for many parents in this country. And Mr. Chairman, this committee has done a lot of good work on social media reform. I like you, we worked on immigration. We can have our differences, but to me, here's what we should be talking about right now. And I'll be brief. As we talk about the federal government's role in deciding what goes in a library or a school, there's been 347% increase in legal crossings uh, since 2020. 183,000 people came over legally uh, in July. We've had 146 people on the terrorist watch list. And FY22, which is about 2.4 million came across, since President Biden's been president, five and a half million people have come across illegally. That's bigger than the state of South Carolina. Last couple of weeks, smugglers with ISIS ties helped migrants enter U.S. from Mexico, raising alarm bells. I'd like to be talking about that. And matter of fact, you can go get the classified briefing. You ought to. It would scare you. And finally, it's just not me saying these things. New York City, the mayor, is at capacity. We have no more room in the city, and we need help. This is a national crisis that begs for a national response since day one. The migrant crisis will destroy New York City. New York City will experience a financial tsunami. The mayor is right. We should be trying to find a way to fix this problem. That, to me, is the biggest priority facing this committee. Uh, and as to this panel, I'll listen, but I'll end where I started. It's not our job to decide these things. And if you're a parent, don't be intimidated. I'd say to my colleague and friend from the state of South Carolina that uh, we joined in a bipartisan effort a few years ago. Gang of eight, four Democrats, four Republicans, wrote a comprehensive immigration reform bill, which I still think in whole can be used today as a template for where we need to go. But for 30 years, Congress has failed to pass immigration reform. And as a consequence, many of the things that are happening on the border and across our nation uh, are, are the result. Uh, I stand ready, and I mean it sincerely and personally, I say this to my friend from South Carolina, to gather together for another gang of eight or 10 or four, whatever the number may be, to put together a comprehensive immigration reform bill. I think we both know what the likelihood of that passing in the other body is, but that shouldn't deter us from doing our duty. I'm ready to do it again. Is, is the publication of books an important part? Mr. Of, Chairman. I'll be with you in just a second. Is the publication of books an important part of our jurisdiction? The Constitution is our jurisdiction, and the Constitution raises questions that I think will be addressed today in this hearing. Senator Corner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to... Uh, point out that uh, we haven't had a markup of an immigration bill in this committee, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction, since uh, the current chairman has been chairman. And even when our Democratic colleagues were in charge of both the House, the Senate, and the White House, um, we haven't considered any immigration bills. I think Senator Tillis joined me in a letter to the, you as chairman asking that we uh, make some attempt um, to try to craft something that might generate bipartisan support. About two years ago, Senator Sinema, the senator from, the senator from Arizona, and I, and, uh, and also uh, Tony Gonzalez, uh, who represents the largest border district in the country, and Henry Cuellar, a Democrat, introduced a bipartisan, bicameral uh, Border Solutions Act, I think we called it. And um, my thought was that at some point, things would get so bad that President Biden or perhaps even our Democratic colleagues might be prompted to actually do something instead of just talk about it. And I guess I was wrong. In the meantime, as Senator Graham points out, there, there have been literally millions, I think seven million people coming across the border since President Biden was, was president. There have been uh, 108,000 Americans died of drug overdoses last year alone, and we know that 
the fentanyl, which is taking our, many of our children's lives in their schools, that 71,000 of those 800,000 were synthetic opioids. We know where it comes from. We know where the precursors come from. We know where the drugs are manufactured and pressed into pills that kids take and die. And then, of course, there's the 300,000 children who've been placed with sponsors, unaccompanied children, and the Biden administration can't tell you where they are. They, they can't tell you whether they're going to school, whether they're getting health care. They can't tell you whether they're being trafficked for sex or forced into involuntary labor. They just can't tell you. And frankly, they don't care. Because if they did, they would want to do something about it. So I'm, I will volunteer to work with you or anybody, but it's got to be more than just talk. It's got to be action. Nobody else can do this job. We are the ones who have to do the job if it's going to get done. And so far, I don't see much in the way of action. Thank you. I would just say in response that uh, the bill we worked on with the Gang of Eight, Senator McCain, Senator Graham, and others, uh, was a good faith bipartisan effort, which I th still think has validity to this day. Uh, and it took more than just a committee hearing to achieve. It took people of goodwill trying to work together and compromise. Uh, I'm sorry that you didn't support that bill, but I think it was a, a bill that we ought to return to at this time. I'm ready to do that at any point. I think we but, need to do so. Mr. Chairman, I take you up on that. Bring the bill forward. Let John tell us what he doesn't like about it, how he can make it better, and let's vote. America is really in a national crisis, according to the mayor of New York City, not Lindsey Graham. Uh, this is incredibly dangerous, incredibly irresponsible. Uh, Afghanistan is now in the hands of the Taliban. The threat of terrorism against the United States is getting worse, not better. ISIS smugglers are involved in getting people into the United States. I think if you brought the Gang of Eight bill or any other bill as the base bill uh, and have a debate on it, this committee would be well served. We could all vote, we could all amend it, and I look forward to doing that. So let's start uh, by having our staff take a look at the bill. What is it, seven or eight years now? Since Count me in. And uh, let's update it, which I'm sure we'll have to do in some respects, uh, and see if we can move it forward. As long as it's bipartisan and has a chance of passing in the Senate, as well as the House, I think it's a good effort. Mr. Chairman, if I could just respond briefly. I can't even remember when the Gang of Eight bill was on the floor. Was that 2016? 13. 13. Oh, 10 years ago. And it didn't pass the House. I mean, I know you are proud of that product, but unfortunately, it didn't pass the House. And of course, as we all know from Schoolhouse Rock, a bill becomes a law when it passes both chambers of Congress and gets a presidential signature. So forgive me for saying this, but that bill failed to succeed. I know you're proud of it, but that was also at a different time than we're in now. And uh, with uh, before the Biden border crisis became so dire. And um, I think there's a different dynamic. Certainly there's a Republican House. They're not going to take up and pass a gang of eight bill. You know that. I know that. Everybody knows that. So forgive me, but when you keep talking about the gang of eight bill as somehow being the gold standard, I have to disagree. Mr. Chairman, may I ask you a question? You may. Mr. Chairman, I wasn't here when when the, when the bill that that you obviously favor. Um, was considered by the Senate. My, my, my question's simple. Did it grant amnesty to folks who are in our country illegally? No, Senator, I don't believe it did. I think the uh, decision in the bill was that those who are undocumented currently living in the United States would report themselves to the government and pay their taxes and their Social Security. They would not qualify for citizenship, uh, at, at least in the outset. Uh, and the, the idea was to get everybody on the books once and for all. I think that is a positive step forward. It did have favorable sections for dreamers, which you can imagine I had some interest in. Uh, but there were several things. How, we, how is that not amnesty? Dream Act? 
How is that not amnesty? Well, it isn't as if they're being forgiven for wrongdoing. They were brought to this country as children and infants. I don't think that uh, there was any culpable conduct on the part of these dreamers, if you wish. So, amnesty, so you were allowed to register, and if you registered, you could stay indefinitely? No, there was a path to citizenship for dreamers. But there was no culpable conduct on the part of infants brought here to this country. I, I'm just trying to understand. Um, it just sounds to me like that's amnesty. In your eyes, it may be, but if a child is brought here at the age of two to say that they are guilty of some criminal act or should have criminal culpability, I think is an extreme position. Well, I'm, I'm not trying to say two-year-olds two, are bad people. I'm just trying to understand what your bill does, and it sounds uh, it's like it's lengthy. amnesty. It's lengthy. Yeah. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Sure. I was part of that. And sort of here's what I'll tell my good friend from Louisiana. You got to get bipartisan buy-in, right? You got to secure your border. If you don't, it's a fruitless exercise. You need to increase legal immigration because we don't have enough people uh, to work in our economy. And you need to deal with people here legally. And I've been very open to doing all those things. But it is 2023. And Senator Cornyn mentioned uh, our effort didn't make it. If you want to use it as a base product, fine. But even I would say in 2023, uh, the problem is so much bigger than it was before. It would take more effort on the border. It would take a real lift to stop the flow. And I'm willing to work with you. I'm willing to compromise. But the administration has done nothing. They sent, they, they, Senator Kennedy, they sent a bill that nobody on our side was supporting. And it was a dream of the left. I mean, again, at the end of the day, I don't mind disagreeing with Republicans about how to fix an immigration system. I do mind doing nothing about it. And the sooner we can have this debate in this committee, and you may be surprised, there might be consensus, big bill, small bill, middle bill, something's better than nothing. America is under siege, and we need to fix this problem. We're Mr. Return, Chairman. Just a second, we're gonna to return to the subject of this hearing Shortly, uh, what Senator Klobuchar? Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing the witnesses, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I did want to point out uh, the argument that nothing has been considered for eight years or something like that. I actually view when you look at the arc of time on this, when President Bush was in, uh, he wanted desperately Republican president to get this done. I remember Senator Graham was in uh, the group that worked on this. Then you fast forward, right, to Obama, and this is the effort you're talking about during that time. But even during President Trump, uh, there was a major effort made led by Senator Rounds, if you remember, an introduced bill that was maybe what Senator Graham was getting at when he talked about a more limited bill. It had funding for the border, significant funding for the border, but it also included more work on work permits and um, on um, Visa, something people on this committee and a number of people on both sides of the aisle care about very much. Dreamers were covered under that bill. Temporary status people who are already here were covered under that bill. I don't remember every single detail, but I do remember is that we had enough Republican senators to get it over the line. The House was going to pass it. Um, and then, unfortunately, uh, President Trump uh, rejected the proposal, and so then it died. That is what happened. I only point that out because that was a very recent bipartisan effort um, compared to the one that was eight years ago. So this has continued, um, and there has been a, a, to say that this was about amnesty or any of that, this was actually about um, moving our country forward because yes, border, do more, but no great country has expanded with a shrinking workforce. And we have made it so difficult uh, for doctors and nurses and for people uh, that want to be here. Um, it has made it really hard in many of our states, in the ag sector, in the hospitality sector, in others. And I just believe um, immigrants don't diminish America. They are America. And we have to find a way to do this. Um, and one of the arguments that always seems to get lost is the economic argument for how important this is right now for our country's future. Thank you, Senator. Senator Whitehouse? I just wanted to observe, Mr. Chairman, your long and passionate advocacy for immigration reform, particularly around DREAMers, and recognize the ranking member for his uh, helpful uh, participation in multiple efforts at reforming the immigration system. I think 
with you both as chair and ranking member, there really is a prospect for doing something bipartisan and useful in this committee, and uh, count me in. I would also flag that the next budget committee hearing coming up is on the economic value of uh, more robust immigration, which has very powerful economic uh, value for Americans. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, and I'll Senator get you, Grant. I know you won't conduct the hearing, but I'm glad I brought this up. <laughs> it seems to be there are a lot of interest about what to do. And the bill that Senator Klobuchar mentioned got 54 votes. I remember it well. There are many combinations, small, medium, and large. The problem is not just small, medium, and large. It's unbelievably out of control. I've been doing this since 2006. I never dreamed that we'd be where we are here today with policies that basically are, are in shambles. Whether you like President Trump or not, we had the lowest illegal crossings uh, in the last 40 years on his watch. Now, what happened? Democratic president changed all those policies, and we have a tsunami of illegal immigrants that are destroying New York City and other, other cities. Rather than talking today about what we should do, I don't care what the base bill is. It could be what Senator Klobuchar said. It could be any bill you want as the base bill. I'd like to get this committee involved in trying to fix this problem. I accept your invitation to be part of that, and let's do it uh, starting with that bill, perhaps others. Today we welcome five witnesses. I'll introduce the majority witness, then turn to Ranking Member Graham to introduce the minority witnesses. Our first witness is the Secretary of State of Illinois, Alexi Janulius. Secretary Janulius serves as state librarian for Illinois as well. He's advocated for libraries in our state and successfully worked to prohibit restrictions on books based on partisan or personal objections in Illinois. I look forward to hearing more about his effort in my home state. We're also joined by Professor Emily Knox, Associate Professor at the University of Illinois, an expert on censorship of literature, and the author of the book, Book Banning in the 21st Century America. Final majority witness is Cameron Samuels. Cameron is a current student at Brandeis University and graduate of Seven Lakes High School in Katy, Texas. In high school, Cameron led efforts to fight censorship in their community. They are the co-founder of Students Engaged in Advancing Texas, an organization that seeks to protect access to books for young people. Ranking Member Graham, would you like to introduce your witnesses? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have Nicole Nelly. Is that right? Yeah, you got it right. Uh, she's president and founder of Parents Defending Education. The organization has the goal of reclaiming schools from activists promoting political agendas by fostering education based on scholarship and facts. She's the founder, also the founder of uh, Speed. Speech First, a national campus free speech organization, has worked at the Independent Women's Forum and the Cato Institute. She received a Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science from the University of Illinois, Urban Champaign, I guess it is, Urban. and her Master of Public Policy in Economic Policy and Foreign Policy from Pepperdine. Uh, our second wit witness is Ms. Uh, is Max Eden. Max, thank you. Is a research fellow at AEI, American Enterprise Institute, focused on education reform specifically K through 12 and early childhood education, and was briefly senior member at the Manhattan Institute. AEI is a public policy think tank dedicated to defending human dignity, uh, expanding human potential and building a freer and safer world. He co-wrote the book, the, the book Ban Mirage Report with, with scholars from the Heritage Foundation debunk, debunking the myth of a book ban crisis in the United States. He received his B.A. in history from Yale University. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Graham. The procedure is customary, five minutes from each witness to make an opening statement and then rounds of questions. Each senator allotted five minutes. Please try to remain within your allotted time. Now I'm going to ask the witnesses as a group to stand and raise their right hand and take an oath. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witnesses have uh, answered in the affirmative. Secretary Janulis, you're the first up. Good morning, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and distinguished members of the committee and the judiciary. Thank you for allowing me the honor and privilege of being here this morning. One of the most exciting responsibilities of serving as Secretary of State in the state of Illinois since January of this year is the ability to serve as the state's librarian. As our youth continue to need educational assistance in catching up 
after the disruption caused by COVID, I believe libraries in every single community across this country have had an especially critical role to play in increasing educational opportunities for all Americans. So imagine my surprise when, in the year 2023, instead of inheriting a debate over what more can be done with and for our libraries, I was confronted with the book banning movement upon taking office. You see, our libraries have become targets by a movement that disingenuously claims to pursue freedom, but is instead promoting authoritarianism. Authoritarian regimes ban books, not democracies. Tragically, our libraries have become the thunderdomes of controversy and strife across our nation, the likes of which we've never seen before. These radical attacks on our libraries have divided our communities, and our librarians have been harassed, threatened, and intimidated for simply doing their jobs. The need to stand up and fight for our freedoms and our librarians, especially at this perilous time for our democracy, is why I initiated House Bill 2789 in Illinois. This legislation, the first of its kind in the United States of America, is a triumph for our democracy, a win for First Amendment rights, and most importantly, a great victory for future generations to come. Under this legislation, Illinois libraries will not be eligible for state-funded grants if they ban books. This right to read legislation will help remove the pressure that librarians have tragically had to endure over the last couple of years. This legislation is important because both the concept and practice of banning books contradicts the very essence of what our country stands for and what our democracy was founded on. It also defies what education is all about, teaching our children to think for themselves. If the book banners care to, they can go to our libraries and check out the Federalist Papers, the US Constitution, and even Supreme Court cases on the First Amendment. What they will learn is that our democracy depends on the marketplace of ideas. That marketplace of ideas will not function if we ban books because we will be banning ideas and preventing our children from thinking for themselves and having the ability to debate and learn and understand different perspectives. We will be banning knowledge, culture, empathy, understanding, and diverse and differing worldviews. Ray Bradbury, the acclaimed Illinois author who wrote Fahrenheit 451, was quoted as saying, the problem in our country isn't with books being banned, but with people no longer reading. You don't have to burn books to destroy culture, just get people to stop reading them. And that's where the real danger lies. Parents, parents and only parents have the right and the responsibility to monitor the access of their children and only their children to library resources. There are more than two and a half thousand instances of books being banned in schools last year, including many American classics, such as 1984, The Adventures of Huck Finn, The Catcher in the Rye, The Color Purple, The Kite Runner of Mice and Men, and I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. Look, I have three young daughters, and there are some books and titles that my wife and I don't feel are age appropriate for them. But I could never imagine a world where I would tell another family what books their kids should or should not be allowed to read. Book banners say they want, quote, local control. What's more local than controlling what takes place in your own household? That's the very definition of local control. And the ultimate irony is that by instituting more book bans, these groups want the government to have more of a say in telling everyone's children what to think and believe. Well, that's government overreach at its peak. Books are a vital way to open our minds to other cultures, religions, identities, and possibilities. Let's also remember the mental health crisis growing across the country. Access to books and the freedom of expression help battle isolation. Books connect us and promote empathy and understanding. Our legislation establishes a clear path, opposite and away from the damaging trend to ban and censor books that a small but loud few disagree with. We need to take any hint of censorship seriously because free speech is not only crucial to democracy, but imperative for the survival of our civilization. Last point I will make. This issue should have nothing to do with political party. 
This isn't a Republican or Democrat issue. This is a freedom of speech and a freedom of ideas issue. Not once during the creation of this legislation did I ask a librarian if they were a Democrat or Republican. Not once did I ask an author if they were a Democrat or Republican. Not once did I ask a constitutional expert if they were a Democrat or Republican. Every single person we spoke to not only was in favor of our legislation, but was deeply concerned with even the concept of book banning. We want our schools and libraries to be open and welcoming settings for education, not cultural battlefields. This legislation aims to unify our communities and seeks to restore a right that some of us may have grown to take for granted, the freedom to think for ourselves. It's my hope that others may look toward Illinois and see the value in adopting our legislation as a model to stop book banning in its tracks and to protect the right to read freely and without fear of retribution. I could not be more proud of this legislation and I implore everyone in this room to please, please be on the right side of history and push back against these book bans in every and any way possible. Thank you again to the committee. Thank you, Secretary Janulius. Mr. Eden. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, members of the Committee on the Judiciary, thank you for inviting me to testify. My name is Max Eden, and I'm a research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. To put it bluntly, books aren't being banned, and it's good that they are. The media keeps using the word banned, but that word doesn't mean what you think it means. In common usage, banned means made unavailable, yet the most banned genderqueer is still available on Amazon. The same, unfortunately, can't be said for Ryan Anderson's When Harry Became Sally. Only books on one side of that issue, it seems, actually get banned. Rather, this conversation focuses on school library availability. If ban means made unavailable, then virtually every book ever published has been effectively banned in school libraries. But that's not even what this word means here. Indeed, a book can be both banned and totally available in a school library. That's because the media has accepted the expansive definition of ban offered by PEN America. If a book has been taken off the shelves, reviewed, and placed back on the shelves, it has, according to PEN, been banned. If a school places a parental permission requirement on a book, it has, according to PEN, been banned. If a school moves a book to a guidance counselor's office, it has, according to Penn, been banned. In their report, Banned in the USA, Penn draws parallels in all this to Nazi Germany. Now, my public school library didn't carry Mein Kampf. Was it banned? I don't know. But I do know that I've read a few books about this era since, and I've so far missed the part where the Nazi party forced schools to relocate books to guidance counselor's offices. To provide a linguistically honest account, the Heritage Foundation's Jay Green, Madison Marino, and I set out to assess how many of the 2,532 books in Penn's 2022 report that were labeled as banned were actually removed from school libraries. We did this with one simple trick. We checked the card catalogs. As it turns out, nearly three quarters of the books that Penn labeled as banned were still in school libraries. Careful analysis also belies the claims that books are being banned because of race or LGBT issues. Whereas PEN America labels the Black Lives Matter inspired The Hate You Give as the fifth most banned book, we found it available in every single school library in question. And when the Washington Post examined over 1,000 review requests made by parents, less than 7% mentioned LGBT without also containing the word sexual. Although those requests may have contained words like pornographic or obscene. And that's what this issue is really about the provision of sexually explicit material to children by public employees. This is a question of judgment. Few would say it's unreasonable to keep Hustler, with its close-up genital photographs, out of school libraries. And few would insist that Romeo and Juliet, with its lyrical allusions to sex, should be removed. Communities must draw the line somewhere between those two points. But where exactly? Take the previously mentioned book, Genderqueer. That graphic novel famously includes a picture of a strap-on dildo blowjob. Is this okay for kids? Some think that it is, and some think that it isn't. You know something weird is going on, though, when parents try to read passages of these books at school board meetings, and the school board cuts them off because they insist the material is too obscene to be read out loud. I guess kids could be listening? Great for them to read, but unacceptable for them to hear? I think, I think that's the principle, maybe. It's, it's kind of gross to say, and I don't want to, but this hearing has been called, and we really can't have an honest discussion without knowing what we're actually talking about. 
We're talking about books with explicit passages about fisting, butt plugs, analingus, the spit or swallow decision, and rape. I won't read those verbatim, but I will read a passage from a few of the most banned books. From the fourth most banned, All Boys Aren't Blue. You were fully erect at this point. You promised that you're not gonna tell anyone? I promised. You then grabbed my hand and made me touch it. It was the first time I'd ever touched a penis that wasn't my own. I knew that what was happening wasn't supposed to happen. Cousins weren't supposed to do these things with cousins. And from the also fourth most banned, Lawn Boy. In the fourth grade at a church youth group meeting, out in the bushes behind the parsonage, I touched Doug Goebel's dick, and he touched mine. In fact, there were even some mouths involved. Ten-year-olds performing sodomy, underage incest, strap-on dildo blowjobs. Is this okay for kids? Judging by the fuss made by the media, NGOs, and some Democratic politicians, it seems there is a politically significant contingent that believes this is all actually very good for kids. But personally, I'm not at all troubled by the fact that some moms believe that this is inappropriate and that some school boards agree. And I find it kind of weird that the United States Senate is troubled enough to call a hearing about all this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eden. Professor Knox. Thank you, Chairman Durbin. You need to turn on the microphone. There you go. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify at this hearing. I'm an associate professor in the School of Information Sciences, the I School at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. I'm also board chair of the National Coalition Against Censorship. I previously served as president of the Freedom to Read Foundation, the legal arm of the American Library Association. My testimony does not reflect the views of the University of Illinois, NCAC, FTRF, or the ALA. My research focuses on information access, intellectual freedom and censorship, information ethics and policy, and print culture studies. I was born in Nashville, Tennessee, and grew up in Columbia, Maryland. I studied religion at both Smith College and the University of Chicago. And after working as a project assistant at the law firm of Kirkland and Ellis, I received my MSLIS from the I School at Illinois. After working as a theological librarian for five years, I attended the doctoral program at the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers University. Books and libraries have always been a part of my life. My mother was a high school librarian at Magruder High School in Montgomery County, Maryland for 32 years. And I often spent my summers with her shelving, conducting inventory, and checking in magazines. We always observed Banned Books Week. Ma would bring home the list of books that had been challenged, and my favorite author, Judy Bloom, was almost always on the list. The characters in her books seemed like real people to me, like me and my friends. I could not understand why people would want me to not read books, to read books, would not want me to read books about my own life. My father was a professor at Morgan State University in Baltimore, and when I followed in his footsteps by getting a PhD, I knew exactly what I wanted to study. Why do people attempt to ban books? It is not surprising that the reasons are clear. Reading is powerful, and the freedom to read can be frightening. According to the ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom, over 2,500 unique titles were targeted for censorship in 2022. Almost all of the books can be categorized as diverse, or books by and about LGBTQIA, native, people of color, gender diversity, people with disabilities, and ethnic, cultural, and religious minorities. At the same time, researchers have found that 71% of Americans oppose book bans in public libraries and 67% oppose banning books in school libraries. Books are one of the most powerful technologies in the world. They bring ideas across both time and space in a small portable package. During this current crisis, there is a lot of discussion about whether or not books are harmful or dangerous or hurtful. This actually depends on who is reading them. As Jesse Shara noted, we do not know what happens when an individual reads a book. Each person brings their own experiences to the book, and those experiences will determine their response. These interpretations are never static. Rudine Sims Bishop argued, books are mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. A book can help us understand each other better by helping to change our attitudes towards difference. 
What we see right now is that people are fixated on the idea that books are only mirrors and sliding glass doors. They only reflect something true about the reader themselves or the reader's world, or they invite the reader to mimic an identity or action they read about in a book. It's important to remember that books are also windows. They give us access to other people's lives. Carrie H. Robinson notes that adults often censor difficult knowledge, or knowledge that many adults find challenging to address in their own lives, but especially with children. What could be more difficult than knowledge that can define your identity? But in order to describe your truth, you must have the words to do so. These campaigns to censor books are unconstitutional and against every person's right to intellectual freedom. That is, the right of every individual to hold, express opinions, and seek, access, receive, and impart information and ideas without restriction. The First Amendment states that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Our right to speak, write, publish, and read are all protected by the Constitution. This right is not based on whether or not people agree with the ideas being expressed. We must remember that as citizens of the United States, we are a free people, and it is our right to read freely. Thank you, Professor Knox. Ms. Neely. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me today. My name is Nicole Neely, and I'm the president of Parents Defending Education, a membership association that gives parents the knowledge and tools they need to be effective advocates for their children's education. Yes, books have become a flashpoint in schools over the past few years. Yet headlines and research papers by activist organizations have intentionally muddied the waters between World War II book burning and what's happening in America's K-12 schools. If you hear one thing today, know this. Families' concerns about books in schools are not book banning. First, the book issue is a curation issue. It should be obvious that a book that is part of a lesson plan in a second grade classroom is more concerning than a book that can be voluntarily checked out from a public library. And also that sensitive topics read to children at very young ages is more concerning than high schoolers learning about the human body in health class. But today, merely suggesting that kids who believe in Santa not have unfettered access to graphic sexual novels is tantamount to murder. In Connecticut, one resident said that the school board's desire to put parental consent rules in place for a few books described as obscene and explicit was, quote, a matter of life and death. It's not. When we do hear from parents about books, the phrase that we hear the most frequently is age appropriate, radical indeed. School boards across the country cut the mics on parents who read passages from these books, stating, this is inappropriate, there are children in the room. Yet those same books are being provided to children in schools. While it may seem politically convenient to scapegoat parents, I ask you to read some of these explicit paragraphs and look at these sexual images with your children or your grandchildren and then tell your constituents whether you consider such content educational. As a society, we don't put Playboy in kindergartens. This isn't considered a book ban, but common sense. Strangely, media coverage over this issue frames any discussion at all as tyranny. It is disingenuous at best and deceptive at worst. Classrooms, schools, and libraries have finite space and must select which materials are on display at any given time. Nor do they have unlimited budgets, so must prioritize certain purchases over others. How these decisions are made and who is involved in that process is a matter of public accountability. Yet when people ask questions, they are crucified. Pretending that objections to minors accessing explicit sexual content is a threat to liberty and literature is a straw man and a distraction from real concerns about the quality of children's education and whether students are safe in school. Second, the book issue is a parental awareness issue. It is not partisan to assert that children do better when their families know what's going on in their lives. This isn't rocket science. The more information parents have, the better they can support their kids emotionally and academically. America has a youth mental health crisis. Yet while schools lobby for increased mental health funding, for which the federal government has provided hundreds of millions of dollars, they are exacerbating that problem. When kids are given assignments beyond their comprehension level that even adults find challenging, violence, war crimes, rape, incest, and more, it should come as no surprise when children become depressed or hopeless. Books from schools should be discussed with loved ones, perhaps to provide historical context or another perspective. Parents know their young learners' quirks and preferences and whether certain material might resonate with or would be appropriate for their loved ones. 
These decisions may differ between children in the same family at the same age based on factors like maturity and sensitivity. Children deserve an education that meets their specific needs. You know, when families ask to simply know when children have ac- what their children have access to, or may wish to put guardrails on material for children of certain ages, they are pilloried in the public square. Such public flagellation is intended to not only extract a pound of flesh from the perpetrator, but to send a message to any other parent with similar reservations. Speak up, and the mob will come for you, too. Far too many schools keep families at arm's length, which could not come at a worse time. Kids would benefit if the adults in their lives worked together in their best interest. But families are now considered adversaries, not even entitled to basic information about their children. In Wisconsin, one school district's teacher training session stated, parents are not entitled to know their kids' identities. That knowledge must be earned. My organization has documented over 1,000 districts across the country with parental exclusion policies, which state that families don't have a right to know their child's gender identity in a taxpayer-funded school. And finally, it is not evil to want to be involved in your child's education. Every time a parent is falsely accused of wanting to ban a book because of reasonable concerns about subject matter appropriateness, neighbors are pitted against each other based on dishonest premises. This is a deliberate attempt to demonize parents and to chill both their speech and activism. 20 years ago, if a six-year-old went to school and talked about sex, teachers would assume that that child was being abused. In 2023, children are not only learning about sex at school, but are being told to keep secrets from their families as well. Please stop mocking parents. Please stop name calling. Please listen to the families who want their children to learn basic grammar rather than be policed on pronouns, who want their children to read at grade level and not taken out of class for political rallies, who want their young children's innocence to be preserved for a few years longer than an activist academic might insist. We are your constituents too. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Neely. Cameron Samuels. Members. Thank you for this opportunity to address you this morning. I am Cameron Samuels, a student from Katy, Texas, and I use gender neutral pronouns they, them. I'm the executive director of Students Engaged in Advancing Texas. In 2022, I graduated in a district of more than 90,000 students. In recent years, we have faced a so-called culture war over books. My experience began when a few people sought to ban Jerry Craft's New Kid, a children's book like any other, but some weaponized identity to censor black books. The conversation on books quickly escalated, and I signed up to speak at the next meeting. Walking into the boardroom that night, I realized I was the only student there. I was the only one whose future was directly affected by the district's decisions. Adults spoke for restricting student access to literature. When my turn came, I spoke for a complete education and the freedom to learn. They applauded the adults, but gave me silence, leaving me isolated in a room of people making policy about students without us at the table. In the following months, I stood up for my freedoms but my school district removed age-relevant books at record pace. Nearly all were targeted for identity, such as LGBTQ themes, racial diversity, and religion. These books represent students. We found ourselves more in challenged books than in school libraries. So I gathered student groups to distribute hundreds of challenged books district-wide. We packed board meetings with the community who knew that students deserve better. Libraries offer discovery beyond classrooms. Censorship limits our liberty to learn. It erases our identity and humanity. When Katie targeted Art Spiegelman's mouse, I could not fathom that cartoon mice walking shamefully naked to Nazi gas chambers were considered sexual by the book's challengers. My ancestors fled religious persecution in Eurasia. I faced too many anti-Semitic remarks in school to remember. Classmates told me the Holocaust did not exist. Many cannot name a Jewish person, so they learn about Judaism from media representation, often dominated by stereotypes. Books like Mouse teach accurate reflections of Jewish identity. If a friend knew the real extent of the Holocaust, maybe they would have thought twice before spraying cologne in my face, saying he was gassing the Jew. Where they burn books, they burn people. Mike Curado's Flamer illustrates a queer Boy Scout 
bullied and traumatized. I saw myself in the book having faced similar harassment in school. Flamer gave me words for my trauma, but it was banned. Censorship bars students from age-relevant materials, leaving them unable to realize their actions can traumatize others. Responding to a police report against the book, officers entered a high school in my district to remove it. In history, the Gestapo secret police in Nazi Germany acted similarly. My community faced tactics. My ancestors fled from across the world to escape. Not only school censor books, but our state. Students and I introduced amendments with senators to book ban bills for accountability and non-discrimination. They were rejected, and already the bill faces a court injunction. Historically, censorship is never on the right side of history. My state is home to 8 million people under the age of 20. And since everything is bigger in Texas, we lead the nation for book bans. Censorship impacts our futures. Students deserve to be decision makers. Censorship is undemocratic. Viewpoint discrimination is contrary to the First Amendment. The Supreme Court rules to, pr to protect literature from scrutiny against identity. We may not see eye to eye, but we are facing a student's rights crisis nationwide. As a 17-year-old, I should not have been focused on defending my rights from bigotry. I should have been learning. Ensuring education reflects its primary stakeholders, the students. We can proceed with a solution to censorship that facilitates collaboration between students, families, and educators. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Samuels. We have a round of questions from the senators. Each have five minutes. Uh, I'd like to direct my question to Secretary Janulius. The American Library Association has written the following. 1,269 demands to censor library books and resources in 2022, the highest number of attempted book bans since ALA began compiling data about censorship in libraries more than 20 years ago. The unparalleled number of reported book challenges in 2022 nearly doubles the 729 challenges reported in 2021. My first part of my question is going to ask you to address that a statement by the American Library Association in light of testimony before us that this is much ado about nothing. And the second one is the notion that book uh, extremist attacks on student uh, and book bans are not that prevalent. Book banning has reached new heights over the past two years. Local leaders in states such as Texas, Florida, Utah, Missouri, Iowa, Indiana, and others have all recently enacted legislation facilitating banning books in local school districts and libraries. These new laws provide for civil penalties and or jail time for violations that pose great risk to teachers and librarians. And that's why groups like the American Library Association have spoken out. Can you reflect on those two statements? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The two are related. Uh, as state librarian, I travel the state of Illinois, and we talk to uh, librarians, we talk to libraries, school libraries, public libraries. The level of threats, intimidation, physical threats, in talking to library, librarians are not my viewpoints. They have never seen it in their entire careers. Because of these political uh, attempts to ban books, we're seeing libraries close down at record numbers. It's difficult to find new librarians who want to serve in roles that used to be their dream jobs. And just uh, a few weeks ago, in the suburbs of Chicago, numerous libraries received bomb threats and were forced to close their doors. So I can tell you, in Illinois, it's very real, and across the country, the problem is worse. And again, what our bill aims to do and will do is to fight for and protect these librarians we have to fight for our librarians. We also have to trust that they have the professional uh, judgment, experience, to make decisions on what books belong in their in circulation. It should not be up to uh, fringe elements screaming from the rooftops about books that they've never read. These are librarians and individuals that have advanced degrees in library science, masters, of library science, masters 
of information and library science, and it's important to make sure that we allow them to t determine what's in circulation, and it's important for us to trust parents to determine what books their kids should, be, should uh, read. And again, it is not up to parents to tell other parents what, ki what books kids should read. Another point I'd like to make when it comes to our legislation, we are not advocating for any single book to be at a library or not be at a library. What we're saying is let's trust our librarians to make these decisions, not an individual parent that's angry or disagrees with a certain viewpoint. Judy Bloom said recently, I believe that censorship grows out of fear. And because fear is contagious, some parents are easily swayed. Book banning satisfies their need to feel in control of their children's lives. This fear is often disguised as, quote, moral outrage. They want to believe that if their children don't read about it, and their then their children won't know about it. And if they don't know about it, it won't happen. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, I have three young daughters. Of course there are books that are not age appropriate. But that's what being a parent is all about. Doing your best to keep an eye on what your children read and what they consume. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just add as well that putting this in, in the context of the world we live in where so much information is so available to people carrying simply iPhones or any laptop computer that they have access to, uh, that we ought to be honest and realistic about that. I agree with you. The first responsibility is the parent's responsibility. And we believe there are age-appropriate uh, restrictions that can be uh, introduced in libraries and other places which generally uh, are consistent with freedom of expression. I thank you. Senator Graham. Thank you. Let's just build on what, what has been said. How do you say your name, sir, Alex? Uh, uh, Alexi Genulius. Okay. Alexi's fine. I want to see if I got the point here. A public library is supported by public dollars. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Are you telling taxpayers of this country just shut up? Uh, is all you worry about is your kids don't have a voice about how your taxpayer dollars are being spent and what kind of community you're living in here? Because you're a parent and you don't let your three daughters read something, is it possible that the other things, that the books in question may hurt the community in the eyes of parents? Can a parent, a taxpayer, complain under this theory? Or should they just shut up? Uh, I would make the exact argument you are. This is about... Um, no, we're not decisions. making the same argument. My argument is you just said, if you've got kids, you police your kids. Otherwise, just shut up and trust the library system, the school system. Let them decide for your community. I completely, totally reject that. If you, I don't have any kids, should I shut up? I pay taxes. When you have a public library and you have a board, somebody decides what books go in or what not to go in, lend your voice to the cause. It's okay to speak out for your community. Uh, Cameron, you have an advocacy group in Texas, right? That is correct. And you have every right to do that. You can advocate for your point of view, and somebody in Texas has to decide who wins. But never shut up. Never be quiet. My point is, the theory of this case is, Parents have a very limited role in life. Apparently, taxpayers have a very limited role in this area. You're paying money to run these libraries. I mean, you're getting money from taxpayers. They should speak up. Ms. Knox, you said, is it unconstitutional for a parent to go to a school board or a public library and complain? Thank you for giving me the chance to respond. Actually, almost all libraries have in their policies something called a request for reconsideration that allows parents or interested community members to object or say what they would like to have changed in a library collection. I think what's important to remember is that this is a collective decision. It's not just one person who gets to say what is in I, a library collection. I, I'm not arguing with you. I, I, somebody has to decide. But the point is the individual here, the individual taxpayer, the individual, individual parent, there's an effort in this country to shut you up, Ms. Neely. Are you going to shut up? 
We will absolutely not shut up. I am here on behalf of more than 10,000 members of Parents Defending Education who want to have a voice in their children's education. Yet they, every time they speak up, are mocked, are shamed, are intimidated and silenced and bullied by elected officials and community members who do not want them to speak up, who are told that they are book burners, who are ashamed of that. And you know what, we will not stop because after COVID, we saw, we had a window into what our children were learning or were not learning, and we were disappointed by that. So parents have not stopped, and they will not stop advocating for their children because the gatekeepers, be it the teachers' unions or anyone else, has shown that they do not have our children's best interests at heart. They have their money and their power structure at heart at the end of the day. Mr. Eaton, is it your testimony there's an organized effort in this country uh, to push ideas, books, literature, through the public school system and libraries that has a very uh, strong political agenda behind it? Is that what you're telling us? Um, I think it, it's pretty clear that that is what, what is going on, yes, sir. Yeah, and if you don't see that, you're blind. You know, in Florida, Ron DeSantis did something you may not like, Mr. Chairman. In Illinois, you do it a different way. But Governor DeSantis decided he would step in and stop what he thought was abusive from his point of view. My point about this hearing is there's no role up here for any of us. Illinois, you do it the way you want. Florida, you do it the way you want. Each school library, you'll decide. But the day that a parent, a concerned citizen, can't come forward and say, I object without being humiliated is a bad day for America. And there's nothing in the Constitution preventing everybody in this country from having a say to express yourself to try to mold the community in a way that you think is better. And some of the things being pushed through this agenda are just quite frankly offensive. I think you made the point earlier and I wanna repeat it. We all, I hope, agree, regardless of our political philosophy, that there are lines that cannot be crossed. Violence is one of those lines. Humiliation is one of those lines as far as I'm concerned. I think what we're talking about is policy here in this country when it comes to the basic rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Senator Whitehouse. Thanks very much. Um, my question is gonna be for uh, Secretary Janoulis. Um, there is one view of the facts here, which is that the conflicts that we have seen in school libraries and in school board meetings involving the school librarian and the local uh, people who serve on the school board grow out of natural concerns uh, by school parents. There is also significant reporting suggesting that national groups funded by right-wing organizations fueled by dark money using people who have no child in the school and may not even be from the state, come into town and mount a surprise attack on local people like a school librarian, people who work in the school, people who serve on the school committee, who are just local people trying to serve the school and who don't have any preparation for dealing with that kind of sudden uh, disruption and and political attack, particularly one that is well scripted, um, well financed, and basically comes in like an out of state artillery barrage on the unsuspecting school. In your investigation into all of this, which of those two factual descriptions is closer to the truth? Uh, thank you, Senator. We have seen, heard, and read about instances where uh, right-wing groups, extremist groups, are trying to shut down or censor a certain book, access to certain books, which is why, again, our legislation is so very important, to protect librarians and their ability to determine what books belong in circulation. I, I'm saddened that, uh, Chairman, or that uh, Senator Graham left. He didn't give me a chance to respond. And this whole notion that protecting the right to read and fighting against censorship is somehow anti-parent is one of the most ludicrous arguments I've ever heard. What we're saying is don't let one parent who disagrees with a certain 
worldview determine what book, whether or not a book should be in the library. That goes against the very point of our democracy, what it means to educate our youth, which is to, to, to allow them to think for themselves. And quite frankly, it's an anti-Republican argument. Republicans are the ones that allegedly are the ones who fight, the ones who fight against censorship and the ones who fight for our Constitution and the freedom of speech. Yet here they are, picking a page out of a random book that they don't agree with and making it sound like parents have no say. That's the exact opposite argument that we're trying to make. And that would be particularly true if the people involved weren't parents, weren't from the community, weren't even from the state, but were being uh, shipped in just in order to stir up trouble, make news, and create division and controversy. That's 100% correct. Let me um, ask consent that an article uh, by a very good reporter named Amanda Milkovitz, who covers Rhode Island for the Boston Globe, uh, be made a matter of record. It's entitled, Libraries Face Increased Attempts to Ban Books, and it's quite a comprehensive uh, piece of coverage about the way in which this movement has appeared in Rhode Island uh, to... Um, make its points, I guess I'd say would be the nice way to say it. Thank you very much. Without objection. Senator Grassley. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to submit questions for answers and give my, uh, use my time just to make a few points on this subject. Uh, first and foremost, the notion that this is a, quote, book ban is misleading and not truthful. This has nothing to do with restricting books to the general public. These books can still be purchased through various retailers if parents want their children to have access to these materials. The issue is protecting parental rights and their ability to raise their children. As a father of five, I can confidently say no one knows what's best for a child more than their own parents. As such, I believe the first principle in education is that parents have a fundamental right and responsibility to guide their children's upbringing. This means parents ought to have the greatest say in determining what is best for their children. The Constitution gives this function to the states. Decisions on education need to be made at the state and local levels. These levels of education are closest and most accessible to the parents and children directly affected. States and school districts are best equipped to craft education policies according to the unique needs of the students. Further, moms and dads can more easily advocate for their children's needs in the classroom or even voice concerns to teachers, school officials, and that's closest to home. And if needed, they can reach out to their local and state elected officials to pursue broader educational policy changes much more easily than coming to Washington. In fact, this is something I regularly tell parents. Parents are their children's best advocate. Our children and their future thrive when state and local communities have this freedom to respond to the unique needs of families they serve. However, when this principle is violated, the results aren't to the benefit of children. For example, we saw this uh, after the passage of No Child Left Behind. This law was enacted with the best of intentions, but showed just how challenging it is for one approach to successfully help millions of students attending schools in thousands of classrooms across the country. I've always been a critic of one-size-fits-all government. Those concerns ring especially true in education. Every child is unique. When we implement Washington Knows Best policy, like No Child Less Behind, the children suffered the most, and the teachers couldn't teach according uh, to it the way they want to. That is why Congress passed the Every Student Succeeds Act to restore local decision-making and better serve individual parents, schools, and educators. A federal policy regarding uh, uh, classroom content sent by federal legislators or some distant faceless bureaucrats in Washington 
would take decision making away from the parents who know best how to raise their kids. Throughout my 99 county tours of Iowa this year, moms and dads shared their experience and concerns about some books and materials that have been presented in Iowa schools. They have expressed reasonable concern about young, impressionable minds to explicit and graphic materials uh, and content in some classrooms and school libraries. So common sense knows best. Unsurprisingly, we've uh, seen every state and school district, uh, or we've seen various state and school districts respond to parents' consent by enacting policies aimed at protecting children. Parents, in conjunction with state and local officials, must determine what is age appropriate for kids to ensure they are nurtured as they grow up. I'll continue to support efforts preserving the right of parents to determine their kids' education and give state and local districts the flexibility to shape policies that fit communities they serve. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Chairman. Senator Grassley. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nobody's talking about um, interfering with the right of a parent to determine what kind of material his or her child should have access to. The issue really is the ability of a group of uh, people, not even parents of students in schools, but a group of people or individuals who are able to go into a school district, a school board, uh, in, in an effort to ban certain books. That is really the issue. And by any definition, I would consider that kind of effort to be an effort on book banning. And in fact, there are states that have already enacted legislation that makes it pretty easy to, um, for anybody to go in and uh, list a book as inappropriate and therefore removed until it goes through some sort of a review process. I'm specifically talking about Florida as an example. So Professor Knox, you, you've done some research on why uh, there is this effort to ban books. Can you tell me what sorts of books are us usually get on these banned book lists? Yeah, I would say that, um, thank you for the question. So the books that usually show up on banned books lists are books that we consider to be diverse. And these are basically books about anybody who is not white, heterosexual, male, cis, um, books that are about LGBTQIA people, about people of color. Um, these sorts of books are the books that we see on the banned books list. And I do want to approach, um, address the idea of banning books. So really what we often say is that these books are not banned, but they are challenged. Mm -hmm. So like Biden's border crisis, Banned Books Week has a nice alliterative uh, ring to it, but in fact, we talk much more about challenging books. And what this is, is removing books from access to its intended audience. So that includes both age appropriateness, but also who did the author intend this book to be read by? Um, that is an important part of thinking about what we call collection development in libraries. We consider all sorts of issues when books are put in a collection, not just, um, not just issues of, uh, you know, do we agree with what is being put on the collection, but also how do we show many different viewpoints and ideas? Um, when we look at the diverse books that I'm sorry to I'm sorry to inter interrupt you, but I, I do understand that the, the target of uh, a lot of these kinds of lists is uh, books that depict uh, diverse, diverse uh, lifestyles, for example, if you want to call it that. And so, for example, one of the books that is being sought or challenged in Iowa is a book called Ho'onani Hula Warrior. This is a book about a child who doesn't see herself as a girl or a boy, but something in between. And this child dreams of leading the hula group, but 
Everyone else thinks that only the boys should lead the hula group, and Native Hawaiians have traditionally recognized the existence of a third gender called mahu, and this book explores this and many other parts of Native Hawaiian culture, yet this book could potentially be banned, as I mentioned, from a school district in Iowa for running afoul of a law against books for younger grades that deal with gender identity. Mr. Janulius, do you think, and also with Dr. Cox, do you think this book should be removed from school libraries? Um, thank you, Senator. I personally do not, which goes again to the fundamental nature of our legislation, which is to um, allow librarians uh, to make that decision. Okay. My guess is they would determine this, this book belongs in our libraries. The, the point I also want to make is, uh, especially with regard to Hula Warrior, the goal of literature mm -hmm. is to reflect back to the reader either the struggles that the reader is facing or to provide insight into struggles that the reader has never had to imagine. Books are a safe place for people who are tr struggling, who need help. And I would you. disagree with one of the opponents here today. I, I do need to get to, sorry, and I don't even need the answer from Dr. Cox, but I do have a, another question for you. Is there any evidence that says that exposure to certain kinds of books leads to harm to a community? Does exposure to an LGBTQ plus book somehow cause harm to the reader? Is there any evidence to that effect? Zero. No, there is not. What I mentioned before is that books can be windows to learn about other people. So it might be that you have a friend who is thinking about their own gender identity and you want to know more. And reading a book like that one will help you understand what your friend is going through. Mr. Chairman, I should think that there is more harm to a young person who thinks that he or she can be shot to death in a school than being exposed to certain kinds of subjects and books. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Rono, Senator Lee. I'm going to be uh, showing a video clip in just a second, but at the outset of this, I want to make clear, I think nearly every American could agree that parents have some legitimate interest in what their child reads or is taught or otherwise exposed to about sex. I, I think it's very, very difficult for anyone to disagree with that. Now, that being the case, I think we need to proceed with this conversation with that backdrop and that understanding. I'm going to play a video clip right now. The video clip is from Deborah Caldwell Stone. She's the legal counsel for the American Library Association. Here's what she has to say on some of these topics, these topics that deal not with book banning, because no one here has banned any book. You can still get these books anywhere you want them. The question isn't whether to ban them. The question is whether they should be included in curriculum or in a school library. A library or a school curriculum, by definition, will be finite. There are a finite number of books that you can put in there. The question is which books should be included and which should not. Let's hear what Ms. Deborah Caldwell-Stone has to say on this topic. But ultimately, we found that the thing that needs to happen most, and it needs to happen before these bills are introduced, is sustained messaging uh, that reframes this issue um, that uh, that takes it away from the idea that these are inappropriate for minors or sexually inappropriate for minors and promote them as diverse materials and programming that are about inclusion, fairness, and the protection of everybody's right to see themselves and their families reflected in the books in the public library. Okay, so I think what we saw here right now was someone saying the quiet part out loud, acknowledging what the goal is. There is a goal here, and the goal is to sexualize children, to provide minors with sexually explicit material, and then hide this content from the parents, hide it by changing the messaging, avoiding the heat by saying, no, no, these are not the droids you're looking for. This is not about sexually explicit content. This is about equality. This is about justice. This is about what's right and wrong. It has nothing to do with sex. Well, of course that's what someone would do if they were grooming your child, if someone were trying to sexualize your child. And make no mistake, that is what's happening. You see, there has been something that has happened in the last few years. During COVID, a lot of kids had online school and parents were able to observe in the classroom in ways that they haven't been in the past. 
observe what was being taught, how it was being taught, and it's awakened something significant among parents throughout America. And that's why you've got groups that are standing up, groups of parents, uh, it, it, places uh, are across the country, including Utah, like Utah Parents United, the American Accountability Foundation, and Ms. Neely's group, Parents Defending Education. They're providing parents with the tools they need and the information that they desire about how best to protect their kids from inappropriate things that they may be being taught or maybe being given at the school where they spend most of the best hours of most days of the week throughout the school year every year. Now, uh, one of the explicit excerpts uh, read by Mr. Eden just a few minutes ago and presented to this committee uh, is from All Boys Aren't Blue, a book available without restriction in at least one Utah junior high school attended by children ages 13 to 15 and at least five Utah high schools. In three Utah high schools, the book was available to children over 16. Now, remember from what was shared with us from Mr. Eden, this book has some really graphic, sexually explicit stuff. This is pornographic. This is obscene. It's certainly not appropriate for children, and it is no matter what else you think about it. It is something that is sexual in nature. And I, I, I really do think very few, if any, American could reasonably disagree with the statement that parents have an interest in what their children are taught when it comes to sex. And so the moment parents take reasonable steps to protect their children and lawmakers honor those efforts to protect their children from exposure, then all of a sudden we've got a problem. And then the left and Vice President Harris cry book ban, even though all of these books are still available. You can still buy them, all of them. On Amazon, you can still buy them, all of them, all over the place. You can't, by the way, buy Ryan T. Anderson's book, When Harry Became Sally, on Amazon. That's been taken down from Amazon. But the point is this. This is not a ban. This is about schools deciding what's appropriate for school children. And sexually explicit, obscene, pornographic material isn't appropriate. And many parents are legitimately concerned about that. So I, I, I'm concerned about this in a variety of respects, and I'd, I'd just like to ask the question, Mr. Eden, is placing common sense age restrictions on pornographic content or removing sexually explicit books from school pericul curriculum and school libraries, is that book banning? And does that carry any ramifications for what we would talk about uh, in terms of the First Amendment, uh, uh, the, in terms of book banning in the First Amendment sense? No, sir. No. It does not. And why is that? What, why is that not book banning? Why does not, that not offend the First Amendment in any way, shape, or form? It's a question of community curation, and no student is actually blocked from acquiring the book in a broader sense. So if you're providing content to a child, that if spoken to a child by you, by the school, if that would constitute, in some jurisdictions, in some circumstances, a crime or a tort, you've got a problem. These school districts are acting in response to legitimate parental concerns. They should be removing these. Shame on them if they don't, and shame on those who want to groom children sexually. Thank you. Senator Booker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd love to pick up exactly where my, my friend Mike Lee left off by reaffirming, I think, the agreement, a bipartisan agreement, is that there's no one in this committee that believes that children should have access to materials that are inappropriate for their age. There is no one that believes that children should have access to uh, inappropriate pornographic materials. This to me is about uh, something deeper that's going on in the American culture right now that is really troubling. And that's why I wanna pick up where he talked about what's going on in our schools. I actually agree with uh, Ranking Member Graham that I don't see much Congress can do. We will, we will make no laws addressing this. But I do think it's important that we hold a committee like this to talk to these larger issues. We have a country right now that is based in the ideals of a commitment to one another. We weren't founded on sameness, same religion, same ethnicity. We were founded on big principles of democratic ideals. And in a diverse democracy, it is so necessary that we know each other, that we see each other, that we understand each other. That's what makes us stronger. And in many ways, our schools become areas, especially the ideals of public schools, where diverse people come together for an education. 
I am suspect of these books being taken out of libraries and schools because I started seeing books that had been there not just for years, but for decades, literally generations, 25, 30, 40 year old books on shelves suddenly being taken off. Stunned that there were books that were important to me when I was growing up. My parents uh, in 1969 had to fight a court case, had to go to, to do legal uh, 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 fights to get into the town I grew up in. It was, we were the first black family ever to move in. They had to get a white couple to pose as them to buy the home to move into the community. As I, I grew up, as my father used to call us, four raisins in a tub of sweet vanilla ice cream. And for me, finding certain books on my library shelf that not only gave me an affirmation, but a celebration that expanded my understanding of history, they were anchors to me, lifelines in some ways. And at a time that I was forming my self-concept and my sense of self-worth, these were the books that became the foundation of who I am some of the greatest works of American literature. And so when I see books by some of the greatest authors, I see Frederick Douglass there, uh, being taken off the shelf, that's when I begin to worry that we're falling into this trap where we are failing to do what is necessary in a democracy, was to create public forums, educational pathways that engender empathy and understanding, that engender deep knowledge, that engender the kind of sentiment that is necessary for democratic democracies to exist. Not a culture of contempt for one another, but a deeper culture of understanding. Now, I, I had conversations with my parents as I got older and more sophisticated, like, wow, you brought up two black boys in a predominantly white community. What were you thinking then? And we talked about a lot of the books that we read at home and read at school, and she would laugh at me right now and say, of course, I could have bought you those books if they were removed from the library, but what was important to have them in the library wasn't for you, it was for your peers, for them to have access. I remember the power of reading Invisible Man in my high school English class and the impact it had on my peers. I had the most nurturing, positive community to grow up in, but to hear what they experienced, expanding their understanding. I remember when I was a college student counseling on a suicide crisis hotline to LGBTQ youth coming out who were considering suicide and the power of just knowing they weren't alone, that there were other people sharing that experience. And so a lot is talked about today, but it, there are deeper issues of what kind of culture are we going to promote in our country? one of compassion, of empathy, of understanding, or one that is going to continue this false narrative of us, us versus them. Professor Knox, in the remaining seconds that I have, I, I actually think there's a, a problem when we are attacking our own history and trying to Disneyify it, as opposed to celebrating what was a rough, difficult, uncomfortable, messy American history, that what makes us even greater is the fact that we had a history that we had to overcome, but that there is some negativity when young people are learning a history that is bereft of the complications and the difficulties of race issues, of gender issues, of, of LGBTQ issues. Is there a danger in giving people a sanitized version of American history? Absolutely there is. It is important that we know the truth of our history. There was a time when I would not have been able to sit here in this hearing to speak to this committee. We've grown from that, but it is important that people know that we have a history of trauma in our country that we have overcome for some people, but we gain nothing by not telling our children the truth of genocide and slavery and Jim Crow, we gain nothing if we don't tell people the truth about that history. And this is one concern I have about many of the books that are being challenged right now. 
is that people want to sanitize this history and say, well, it was all in the past, or even if it was all in the past, it's too painful to discuss. It may be painful, but it is still the truth, and it must be said. Um, it is important to be citizens of this great country that we know where we came from so we can make the world better as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I might say that there's a vote on, and I may have to leave and uh, recess for a few minutes, but the Senator from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of you for being here today. And as I've listened to your your testimony and your answers to questions, Mr. Chairman, one of the things that has been of concern to me today is that there is apparent uh, your concern um, or outrage over some of the books and things that are being uh, banned or omitted or disallowed, but there has been nothing said about what big tech platforms or major publishers are doing by banning or refusing to work with conservative authors. And that is a troubling trend that I have seen. I have heard from Tennesseans uh, about some companies that are more left-leaning or are liberal media companies, and they are choosing to disallow publications. You've had something with Vice President Pence. You've had something with Justice Barrett. But that is not brought in to this hearing. And there are, there are two discussions that ought to be taking place because we do have very talented people um, that are being blocked out of that publishing and that distribution network. So that is of concern to me. Ms. Neely, um, in your testimony, you did talk a little bit about some of the egregious attempts that the left has made to silence anyone that doesn't agree with them to remove publishing deals, to disallow distribution on platforms. So I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit more about that and the effect that that has. Your microphone. Parents are being intimidated, challenged, and canceled for speaking up. And I think, aside from the big tech platforms, what also concerns me is the state action that is being taken. You know, as much as we talk about this, uh, the, the districts that might be discussing what a book can or can't be in a school district, I think it's also worth discussing the local control, the issue that Mr. Giannoulis mentioned about districts that are actually removing control from families. Um, in Montgomery County, Maryland, in Dearborn, Michigan, there have been countless Muslim families that have spoken up because they want the right to opt their children out of sexually explicit lesson plans. They are being denied that opportunity. They are being forced to have their children read books, again, that are graphic, that are sexual. And these are books that not only maybe aren't relevant to the curriculum, but that don't comport with their family values. Those decisions are being taken away by localities. In some states, there are efforts by state actors, by, by the states themselves as well. This is something that parents are concerned with. And so to conflate that issue, that I don't want my child to be forced to read something with a book that is being burned in Nazi Germany is disingenuous and false. Well, parental rights are something we hear a lot about in Tennessee. And I think we are just very fortunate to have some really wonderful, dedicated teachers who have worked with parents and have allowed parents to be involved in a child's education. Um, I, I think it's important that parents have the ability to participate and to have that say. So um, tell me what you're hearing from parents when it comes to directing the children's education and 
what they are hearing. You've spoken about a couple of things. What are they hearing when it comes to blocking some of this sexually explicit or pornographic material? One problem they have is simply gaining access to know what their child is learning at all. Parents are being forced on a regular basis to file public records requests. And when they file those records requests, they are being charged hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. Recently from Fairfax County, Virginia, I received a FOIA estimate of $35,000 to gain access to materials. That is appalling. That is meant to discourage and chill parental involvement and engagement in these issues. It is meant to tell families, go away, you're not welcome here. The experts know what they're doing. We saw the Democrat Party of Michigan put a Facebook post out saying, the purpose of public education is not to, te is to teach children what society needs them to know. Implicit in that is that they know better than we do, than families do, what society needs them to know. That is an insult, it is a slap in the face to families, and that is something that families will continue to fight against. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Um, I think it's safe to say that, that all of you are here today because you are opposed to government censorship. Is that, is that right? Have I got that broadly correct? Okay, we can agree on that much. Um, book banning is a form of government censorship. Is that broadly speaking correct? Professor Knox, let me, you're, you're an expert in this. Let me just ask you, um, book banning is a problem under the First Amendment because it's the government telling private individuals, authors, what have you, what they can and cannot write, telling the public what they can and cannot read. Is that broadly speaking correct? Yes, that's correct. So now what if, what if the books were digital only? Could the government ban them then? So no, no hard copies, no, no physical copies, it's just digital books. Could the government engage in book banning then under the First Amendment? No problem. No, that's about a format of the particular book, and that really doesn't matter when it comes to whether or not government is banning a book. Okay, what, what, if, what if the government made a list of authors whose books it wanted banned and also went to all of the publishing houses in America, the government did, and said, do not publish the books by any of these authors or we will punish you. Is that a problem in the First Amendment? My hope is that the government would not be involved in the decisions of a private company. Good, I would hope so too, but apparently that is not the case in the United States of America today under this administration because the hypotheticals I've just given you aren't hypotheticals at all. They've happened and we know that they are happening the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals just ruled in a case, Missouri versus Biden. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. It's going to go down, I think, as a landmark case in the worst possible way in First Amendment law, because what the Court of Appeals found is that the White House, not just the federal government, but the White House actively coerced every major social media platform in America. Let me say that again. Every major social media platform in America to ban speech that the White House did not like. What are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about speech on the COVID-19 pandemic, speech on the 2022 congressional elections, speech related to mask mandates, speech related to vaccines. What did the White House do? Well, over a period of years, they met with on a regular basis the leaders of social media companies and demanded that the speech they did not like be taken down. They further demanded that these same social media companies amplify the White House's speech. Amazing. So take down all of this speech that we don't like, amplify our own speech. Unbelievable. What kind of speech are we talking about? Well, for example, not just public officials, but Parents, here's an example from my state, the state of Missouri. This is, I'm reading you from the opinion here. One parent who posted on nextdoor.com, which is a site operated by Facebook, posted an online petition to encourage his school to remain mask optional, found that his posts were removed without notifying him, and his friends never saw them. Another parent in the same school district who objected to mask mandates for school children responded to Dr. Fauci on Twitter and promptly received a warning from Twitter that his account would be banned 
if he did not delete the tweets criticizing Dr. Fauci's approach to mask mandates. These objections, amazingly, these, this censorship was taken at the direct behest of the federal government, the direct behest of the Biden administration. Professor Knox, is this a violation of the First Amendment? Only a judge can make that determination. And a judge has. I'm glad you said that. Multiple judges. The district court, federal district court, said there was a direct First Amendment violation. Court of Appeals, unanimously, three-judge panel, unanimously said direct First Amendment violation. I can't think of another time in American history when the President of the United States, and I say that advisedly, because the record reflects that White House officials were sending emails and communications to these companies saying that the President himself wanted the censorship. So you've got the government doing exactly what Professor Knox said is not permitted under the First Amendment, directly coercing the speech of private parties, and not just one or two authors, but parents all across the country, unprecedented in the history of this nation. So I'm glad we're having this hearing today. I hope that we will have more like it to expose the censorship happening at the highest levels of our government. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that this this opinion, this judgment by the Fifth Circuit, Missouri versus Biden, be entered into the record in full. Without objection. I will leave it there. I know there are other Senator Kennedys here who want to ask questions, but I just want to say for the record that this kind of censorship is un-American, it is unconstitutional, and I hope it will go down as a sad chapter in American history that we can close here and now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I confess I'm a little confused, and I appreciate the argument that, that we've, or discussion that we've been having, but for me, it's a little too conceptual or, I don't know, metaphysical or the, theological or whatever you want to call it. I want to try to understand what you're asking us to do. Let's take two books that have been much discussed. Um, the first one is called All Boys Aren't Blue, and I will quote from it. I put some lube on and got him on his knees, and I began to slide into him from behind. I pulled out of him and kissed him while he masturbated. He asked me to turn over while he slipped a condom on himself. This was my ass, and I was struggling to imagine someone inside me. He got on top and slowly inserted himself into me. It was the worst pain I think I have ever felt in my life. Eventually, I felt a mix of pleasure with the pain. Close quote. All boys aren't blue. The second is a, a, another much discussed book. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's called Gender Queer. Okay. Let me read an excerpt from that. Quote, I got a new strap-on strap harness today. I can't wait to put it on you. It will fit my favorite dildo perfectly. You're going to look so hot. I can't wait to have your cock in my mouth. I'm going to give you the blowjob of your life. Then I want you inside of me, end quote. Now, Mr. Secretary, what are you asking us to do? Are you suggesting that only librarians should decide whether the two books that I just referenced should be available to kids? Is that what you're saying? No. Okay. Tell me what you're saying. Well, uh, first of all, th there's this... Don't give me a speech. Tell me what you're asking will, me to do. With all due respect, Senator, and, uh, the words you spoke are disturbing, especially coming out of your mouth is very disturbing. But I, what I would also tell you that 
We're not advocating for kids to read porn, to Senator Booker's what point. What are you advocating for? We are advocating for parents, random parents, not to have the ability, under the guise of keeping kids safe, to try and challenge the world view of every single manner on these issues. You're getting conceptual game. I'm what not getting conceptual. Well, I'm yes, saying you that are. Yes, you are. Because you, you, I want to know what you're recommending. It sounds to me like what some of you are saying the librarians should decide who gets to see that book. I'm saying when you're making, when individual parents are allowed to make a decision of what, where that line is and to kill a mockingbird, which involves a rape scene, should that book be pulled from our libraries? I think it becomes a slippery well, slope. I think you ought to think about it a little bit more before you come here. I've thought about, if Senator. If you're going to propose something, you ought to be able, in 30 seconds, to be able to explain what Senator, you're asking us to do. Senator, Ms. Kelly, what do you understand well, let me skip you for a second, Mr. Um, Cameron. Tell me what you're you're proposing. It's pronounced mix. Um, mix is that how you? How would you like me to refer to you, Senator? Your definition of sexual is synonymous with LGBTQ identity. Library. I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you to tell me. You read those two excerpts. Gender Do queer. Do you think that? Are you asking that only librarians and not parents have any say in whether minors can read those books? Is that what you're saying? Genderqueer has never been in my school library, so it's never been banned. Well, suppose it was. Should it be up just to the librarian, or should parents have a say? There should be facilitation of collaboration between students should parents parents and parents have educators. a say? Parents should be working with students and educators to okay. be making decisions because... Right. Students right. are and who decides ultimately the librarian or do you take a vote or who takes the vote? Book review committees in the community in my school district. You Perfect. want a committee to decide? There are committees. Okay. Well, I'm asking you, how do we decide whether the two books that I just referenced should be available in the library? What, what would you, if you, were, if you were running things, what would you do? All Boys Aren't Blue, the scene you mentioned, is about sexual abuse. I know what it's about. It's not What erotic. would you do in terms of making the books available? Would you say anybody can see them, or they have to be in a special session? Students who do not read books like All Boys Aren't Blue cannot learn what is appropriate. I understand that. They cannot learn about I understand, but none of you abuse. want to answer my question. You come here and you say censorship is bad, and of course it's bad. But the obvious response is, okay, you heard the books we're talking about. Okay, we're not talking about Catcher in the Rye. So tell me what you want, who gets to decide. And all I've heard is the librarians. And parents have nothing to do with it. And if that's your response, what planet did you just parachute in from? Parents, Senator. Or what country, more appropriately? This is not China. Parents, Senator, with all due respect, the parents absolutely have a say. My parents were immigrants, came to this country. We never checked out books without our parents seeing what, what books we were reading. They encouraged us to Mr. read books. Mr. Secretary, I understand this is good for your politics back home. It's got nothing to do with I'm my not, politics. No, my bill is passed. Of course it does. My it bill every, is passed. has everything to do with your I'm here, politics. I'm here to... But you came here with a problem, and I'm trying to understand the solution, and you don't have one. We solved the solution. Other than, we solved other than, the solution other in Other than Illinois. to tell us that if we don't agree with you, you're on the wrong, we'll be on the wrong side of history. We solved the problem in Illinois. We fixed it. Because we uh, well, there are others you make. could work on. Well, that's I, why I'm, I'm here out of to help. Time. Thank I'm you, Mr. Help, Chairman. To help other states make these decisions. At this, this, at this point, there are no senators here who have not been recognized, and uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. I appreciate all our witnesses appearing before the committee today, and I know that all my colleagues on the committee want our children to have access to books that are appropriate for their age. There are some serious disagreements, however, about what content is objectionable, that is inevitable and healthy for a democracy. We need to work together as a country to try to create clear standards for access to books so that no one individual can cause a book to be banned for an entire community. I'm proud of my home state, Senator, Secretary Janulius, for leading the effort to push back against book bans. And I hope other states will follow your example. Libraries and the tre treasured books within them are just too important to allow this rise in censorship to continue any longer. 
Let's come together to protect the freedom to read and learn and stand up against book banning wherever it occurs. The record for today's hearing will remain open for one week. The hearing is adjourned.